Hi, everyone. Welcome. Carl Steinbeck here. I want to talk about today's hearing for Donna Adelson, the case management hearing. It was set there in the Leon County Courthouse at 2.30 Eastern time. And it was tele, um, it was promoted via Zoom through Judge Everett's chambers. And I understand a bunch of folks didn't have a good connection there. I did talk to a couple folks that were able to see or watch the hearing. And so I'm going to give you feedback from that. You can also go to the Tallahassee Democrat, their local paper. They have a couple pictures there. And we, from what we can see there, that uh, both attorneys for Donna were in the courtroom. So Alex Morris, the local attorney there in Tallahassee, he was there as well as Daniel Roshbaum that's coming up from the Miami area. So both of her attorneys were there as well as both the Georgia and um, Sarah Dugan, I believe from the state. I didn't see pictures of them in the courtroom, but at least Sarah, I know, I think Sarah was there because they quoted her in the Tallahassee Democrat. And, uh, and then we also had via Zoom then, the, Donna was fed into the courtroom so you could see her and she also had a some kind of protective face mask on there a medical type mask and not sure why she had that on I saw another photo where she didn't have it on so I don't know if she put, took it off when she started speaking but they did ask her if she was uh, had any if she, if she had any uh, contacts with the state regarding a plea agreement and they, they had first asked Sarah that and Sarah said that she'd have to check back and let the court know. So apparently there's been no plea discussions, nor do I think there will be any. I think that it's most likely she's gonna to go to trial. They've invested all this money in attorneys. And normally from what I've seen for my uh, many years of doing trials, that if you hire that that um, that expensive a defense team, you're normally not gonna plea, plea out in that case. So I think that same is probably gonna happen here, especially when you got family members, but, um, in any event, the uh, the hearing wound up resolving the most important issue we were waiting for, and that's when is the trial date going to happen. So the actual jury selection now is going to be scheduled for September 30th. So we were thinking it was going to be in May, and that looked, sort of looked like the posturing from what we had with the previous counsel for Donna, which is Descalzo, Maricel Descalzo out of Miami. But as it turns out, we're not going to have a trial within six months of her arrest down in Miami, but it's actually gonna be a lot later in September, but uh, it's still it's still quicker than what we had for Charlie. So that's one one good thing about it. But I think a lot of, I've heard some folks complaining about, oh no, more months of delay for the Markells and more delay, that means more delay before other Adelsons will be arrested. And yeah, I can, I can share, I can share the uh, frustration in that definitely. And I guess one thing that hopefully this, this extra several months will buy for the state is hopefully they're gonna gin up more evidence to go after and prepare the evidence to go after other Adelsons. And it really just, this long delay just really, in comparison to the last case I covered a couple nights ago, which was the uh, the Jared Bright again, who was murdered there just a couple hours to the east there in the Jacksonville, Florida area. He was murdered in February of 2022 and they've already got three folks his ex-wife or his ex-wife's husband and also the, the actual trigger puller hitman all three of them got arrested and the state's trying to try them together so it is really if you follow that case it's also a good comparison to see how the different two state attorney's offices act in that case in, in that particular case you have a melissa nelson she's the top prosecutor the equivalent in the fourth judicial district to the jack campbell led office there in Tallahassee. So you have a completely different way of looking at cases and they're very much similar. I mean, they're mirrored in so many ways where a super wealthy family was involved in having a ex gunned down and, uh, and you got multiple kids involved in both situations. And so the fact that you couldn't have the, this, the grievances ironed out in a court there's also a desire to move out of state and whatnot, whatnot. So it's just really, really bizarre and sad and tragic for the for the so many kids involved in, in both these cases. So I do think that if, if you've followed my case, I know there's a bunch of new people in the last couple months that have joined looking at this. And I would just say, if you go back to my earlier podcast, you can see where I was very adamant that I just thought this one at a time approach of bringing down the Adelsons, I, I thought was was really slow afoot and I would have really liked to see them charge all at once. 
or even if they weren't charged all at once, but you line them up so that they'll be tried one after the other and not this, so let's wait and see until, and see if we, if we get a conviction before we have to go over after the other Adelsons. That's more of an approach. I would say if, if you're not very sure that how strong of a case you have, or if you, or if you're um, maybe don't have experience or capability and skill set to be able to try a case that has a lot of circumstantial evidence in it. But I thought these cases are very strong against, uh, in particular against Charlie and also Donna. And I mean, when you, when you watch the Donna trial, I think many of you will be thinking what I'm thinking is be shaking your head going, why have, why wasn't Donna brought in with Charlie's trial? And I think you'll see the same thing with Wendy when, when she's uh, ultimately prosecuted as well. And even, even at Charlie's trial, I was thinking if you had, and I've said that if you had just another day and a half or two of evidence of all the stuff that Wendy was doing behind the scenes, setting, helping set this up both before, during, and after the murder of Dan Markell, it just really makes you wonder, it's like, what, what's going on there? And, and then you contrast that with what's going on in the Brightigan murder case there in Jacksonville. And just really, you have a really huge difference of prosecution styles. And so I, I do think that that's uh, excellent for the Brightigan family members to uh, see justice being pursued that much faster for them, because I mean, this is almost like a cold case uh, type of setup to wait this many years. And if you, if you stop to think about it, as I said before, they had the, the, uh, the state attorney's office was saying, well, we're wanting more evidence before we charge the Adelsons. And yet what did they get out of those six years? All they needed was an enhanced videotape of the, uh, and according to them, enhance an enhancement, a better version of the, of the videotape for the, um, the conversation that Charlie had with Katie McBanwa there at the Dolce Vita restaurant. And yet I, I've, uh, after seeing the, all the evidence that was presented in Charlie's case, I mean, you really didn't even need that. There was so overwhelming evidence. The wiretaps was just a really, really the, the thing that you could not undo as a defense attorney. There's no way you could, you could trick and bamboozle and confuse a uh, jury with that kind of a detailed long, conversation going on between Harvey and Donna undercover um, where they thought when they're trying to talk cryptically and, and in code to avoid police detection. But uh, none, nonetheless, the um, I do think it's great that we got a trial date finally now that um, she needs to have her attorneys that be adequately prepared. That's more than enough time because you have Daniel Rashbaum on the case who's going to be right in there with Alex Morris and I think that um, you don't want to have a case being too rushed where the defense attorneys aren't prepared. So I think that'll be more than adequate time for Alex Morris to get up to speed on it. So I don't, I don't anticipate another delay like they would have for Charlie's case. And um, if you stop thinking about it, remember Rashbaum said that he, uh, he was telling the judge there could be up to three weeks of witnesses. And, um, and when they're doing a case management conference for Charlie's case and, and as it turns out, you know, if his witness list was was pretty much a replica of all the state's witnesses and um, for Charlie, for a defendant, you don't ever put the defendant on the witness list. That's I've never seen that done before. That's not required. And uh, they have an automatic constitutional right. So and, and a lot of times it's a, a game day decision on whether they are going to put the defendant on the stand or not. So that's that's never the case where they have. The defendant identified on the uh, defense witness list, but in any in any case, I think you're not you're going to see probably the same kind of thing where Donna can't produce any witnesses to really uh, bring forward her uh, her defense at all. And so the um, <clears throat> the other thing is, I I think that um, now that they have a couple of extra months to prepare, this is really a great time to go over the digital evidence and have it be presented sort of like they did in Charlie's trial with that great graphics display, have all that rolled up and enhanced again and added to what they had done in Charlie's trial, those great graphics that Georgia had presented in her, in her closing, as well as through the testimony of different state's witnesses like Sergeant Corbett. So I think that it's going to allow them to perfect their, perfect their case even better. And so, yeah, it does pain me to think that the Markells have to wait that much longer, but the, um, they really don't have trials in the summertime there from what I've seen. They're, if they don't finish them up by May, early June, they really don't.
do trials in the summer, which I guess, is it because of child care for a lot of the jurors and whatnot, or a lot of people have vacations? I understand that was brought up when they're trying to figure out a, the scheduling that folks already had things marked off in their calendar for uh, different events and in, in their in their personal lives or social lives. And that's one of the reasons I thought maybe this trial date would have been haggled out behind the scenes way beforehand. And this, this date was actually more or less just a, a public way to confirm it. And so I did not hear that there was an actual any dates like you normally, if you have a trial date, or in this case, it's a jury date, normally you also have deadlines and uh, suspenses of when different things are due, like state's witness list, defense witness list, the exhibit list and evidence list, those kind of things are all marked out this this early in the in the process. So so there's no surprises to the judge. And so the judge can properly manage that for for the judicial economy's sake. So I didn't hear any of that going on today. So they do have another hearing status hearing, I believe, in, in July. But I would expect there to be more details forthcoming. And maybe it was put out in, in the order today that they just didn't talk about it. But um, I'll, I'll look at that. I didn't have a chance to check the Leon County Court records on that. So, so with that, I'm I'm going to jump to the questions that you have here. If you want, if you've posted com questions before, now if you want to go ahead and copy and paste those and put those here now, and go ahead and put if you can some red question marks so I so I can easily distinguish questions from comments among y'all. Yeah, seven months in freedom for Wendy. Yeah, that's that is disheartening. Um, we just gotta we just gotta gotta be grateful. At least there's uh, one convicted of the Adelsons and another one ready to go here in September. So there'll be two down, two more to go. Yeah, twenty second of July. Thank you, um, Connie. Misdemeanor here is asking, will Donna uh, testify? Yeah, she's going to have to testify to describe her her version of what happened and whatnot. So that's going to be hard for anybody else to describe it. I don't really foresee her having Charlie describe that. Charlie's a hot mess of a witness, and he would definitely convict her. So they they but they could they could call him. They but I think definitely for sure they would call Donna as I've said before you don't want to have a co-conspirator testify if, if you're a defense counsel but is it possible they they would do something like that who knows but I, I just I just I'm just going by what I think a normal defense lawyer would do yeah Sergeant Corbett was very impressive impressive witness at Charlie's trial I mean it was so sophisticated testimony I I like calling him General Corbett because he came across like a general, not a sergeant. What uh, that was that's was, that was like the most impressive law enforcement testimony I've ever seen, especially with such complex data. He was so smooth and professional. Very, what a great what a great tribute to uh, the Tallahassee Police Department there. Ms. Meaner is saying, will they get Brother Robert to testify? I, I think the prosecution should. The defense definitely doesn't want to call Robert, but he can help set the family dynamics and how, when he was talking to them after the murder of Dan Markrell, the weird things they're saying and doing. So that's that's very damning. That's very going to be very damning for them. I was surprised he didn't call him in Charlie's case, but it was so overwhelming for Charlie that they decided not to. And it'd be a, obviously a huge embarrassment for him, but... He's a high character doctor up in the New York area that he, he would do that. And um, as a sad as a sad day for him, it would be I think it would also be uh, something that he would do in the interest of justice to uh, to help do the right thing.
SB is asking, have you ever done a case with an entire family like this? Not one of these people tried to stop the murder of Dan. No, it's really, it's really rare to see, you know, the, the father and his, um, and the mother of the, uh, of the two children, um, uh, which is Harvey, excuse me, uh, Charlie and Wendy to be involved in this. So you got four adults. One of them is a lawyer. Two of them are dentists. One, in fact, went to extra schooling and to be a periodontist. And then you also have the wife who's the office manager. She didn't have the, any kind of schooling that the others did, but to just have nobody stop and think, wait a minute, this is not going to go smooth. How are we going to have somebody murdered in broad daylight and we're going to trust these people how do we know they're not going to turn on us and, and extort us for life if they get away with it i mean it's just such a brain dead uh, absolutely ridiculous thing to try to pull off and think you could get away with it so the real outrageous thing besides that the way they thought they could get away with it is also the the fact that the more adelsons haven't been arrested and they should have been convicted long ago so it's it's just i think it's one of the things that really is putting a target on the back of the state attorney's office like what are you doing what's taking so long so i think they're really feeling the heat they got the momentum momentum right now that's super super much a huge win behind their um back but you know if they don't take advantage of this and start charging harvey and wendy then it's really really a lot of lost momentum it's going to be more frustration of public and public calls for them to have to explain themselves because they got no excuse now really Thunder Queen is asking if Harvey were to pass away before trial, would Donna be released to attend services? I don't think so. I, I doubt that very much. I mean, they could try to ask for that, but I don't, who knows in Florida, anything's possible, but I don't think so for a first degree murder. Now they're not going to risk, can you imagine how many law enforcement and how far away they'd have to do it and all that? I don't see that happening. Maybe they'll let her attend via zoom or something like that where she's not released out of her cell. <laughs> yeah, Giovanni's asking, when will Wendy be arrested and going to need the exact date? I, I don't, I can't give an exact date. It should have been years ago in my book. That's all I can tell you. But if you follow the, follow this, this slow pace to the state attorney's office, think about how the fact that they had to rush through and hurry up and get a warrant before Donna was ready to board the plane that day. So they got that day's notice and she was on an eight o'clock flight, roughly eight o'clock or was it eight 40? I think it was eight 40. And I think they nabbed her about eight o'clock. So they came that close to uh, not being able to get her. And they were like flying through in the state attorney's office, ginning up the uh, arrest warrant. So they were that cl close to almost letting her not being able to process that in time. So I thought that was probably revealing it in terms of they're probably not even working on Wendy at all until after Donna gets convicted. So I think they were, they were probably not sure if they're going to get a conviction on Charlie. And like I say, my assessment of the evidence was like, this is a slam dunk win. And I think you look at any of the other attorneys following the case that I've heard about, no one said it was a slam dunk win. And I even predicted it would be just a two hour or so deliberation and if it wasn't for the fact that they hadn't had lunch till two o'clock in the afternoon it, it probably would have been uh two hours or less so it was that overwhelming of a case and even the dolce vita wasn't wasn't uh the thing that tipped the scale it was just all of it cumulatively was was just a tidal wave crushing any kind of defense John Wesley Holmes is asking, what are your thoughts on the defense using a jury consultant again? I think that that's probably not going to happen. They probably realized that that was a bad maneuver for them on Charlie's trial because it didn't pan out at all. And it was really, I thought, a chaotic display of an army of attorneys from New York City going in and out of the courtroom and really 
not having any kind of perception of how they come across the local community there that's made making up the uh, potential juries jurors and so what i thought was uh you need to have continuity of counsel so the same attorney that does vor dire should do the opening and the closing i think that's very important the the least important one i would say is opening but you definitely need to have the same attorney doing vor dire as, as as the uh, closing and then and then think about it after they they did the jury selection they up and left town they completely jetted out of there and they never once again stepped foot in that courtroom so i think it's very much an issue that uh they they don't have anything to show for it and it's probably close to a million dollars is my guess for them to to come down there all those days and they did the whole workup of uh that did they did some mock jury uh type presentations and stuff like that and for them to think that this defense theory could could fly it was just really i mean i would say me as a lawyer i would say i'm not going to waste i would never advise my cl client to waste their money on a jury consultant when you got a dead ring loser of a defense theory that's never going to fly i mean I, I can't imagine i was thinking about that today like if i had a client when you're rehearsing what they're going to face through cross-examination the prosecutor for them to sit there and go through Charlie's direct testimony and to actually have it come across and, and be credible. See, like one of the things I do when I'm preparing a witness that um, either witness or especially my client, if they're going to take the stand as a defendant, I'm making sure that what they're saying is actually something that even makes sense. Because if they're saying something that doesn't make sense, I'm going to wait a minute. This doesn't make any sense and so if, if their whole story is basically just some something that's um so far officially ludicrous i'm gonna i'm gonna basically take the standpoint that look we i i really really i, I really don't want to go to trial with this kind of testimony because you're gonna you're gonna wind up losing a jury's gonna convict you and so i'm, I'm just thinking of a case like if i had charlie as a, as a defendant and he got up there and in my office and he's telling me this is his story and what happened all that kind of stuff I, i'd just be like i don't know how many, many many minutes i could sit there and listen to that and take it and uh and just be going like throwing up my hands going do you really expect a jury to believe this and if you notice the um and those for the, those of you that didn't remember back when charlie testified that whole day, he spent an entire day on direct examination with Rashbaum asking him questions and doing a lot of testifying himself when he's asking those questions. And as it turned out, the uh, the audience there, the spectators in the courtroom were so bored with his testimony. It was just so outlandish, so insulting to anyone's intelligence that they wound up clearing out of there. I mean, by noon, most people had left. There's only a few people that came back. And so that's how bad of a job he did. And you could tell from the jurors that they didn't think his, uh, when I was there looking at his closing argument, you could just tell that they were like, not really uh, not really buying what he's saying at all. That's what I was reading from their body language. So it was just, a, it was just an absolute loser of a case. So I just don't see how a jury consultant is worthwhile on a, on a case you have no shot of winning. Our sauce is asking, will Donna be able to maintain her calm facade through her trial? Well, I think if you notice Charlie's behavior, he seemed very sort of like almost like buzzed, sort of like high or stoned or something like that. So I think you'll probably get some kind of medication as well that uh, Donna will be on trying to calm her down and whatnot. But I think her lack of likability to a jury is definitely going to come across. I mean, she is not going to fit in with that tallahassee jury at all even though the uh the tallahassee is sort of like a little melting pot of sorts she got a lot of people there as uh as a part of the state university it's a very very much a melting pot and you also have a lot of folks that are from um other parts of the state there when this when the legislature's in session but obviously they don't live there so they won't be vote, voting members but i think that um she's uh she's not going to come across as as likable I think it's very critical. I think it's very important to have a likable attorney, to have a likable defendant as well. I think those are two key things. And I don't you can't change that with Donna. You can try to get her to come across, you know, softer and whatnot. But I just 
she's she's gonna she's gonna come across uh, not only is she gonna come across bad but if they can po poke her buttons on uh, cross-examination and get her angry i think that uh, it's gonna it's gonna be help secure the win for sure so roxanne is asking if harvey can get subpoenaed to testify even if he takes the fifth yeah, it's the same kind of deal like we had for Wendy. So in, in Florida, they have this unique statute that says you cannot invoke the Fifth Amendment and you can be forced to com uh, be compelled to give your testimony. And if you think about what Judge Everett was threatening for Harvey and Donna, if they didn't cooperate, remember that their attorney at the time, they had the same attorney that Maricel Descalzo, she was making an argument that there was a constitutional right not to have to cooperate with the state. And the judge did not agree with that. And he threatened to have them arrested and, and hauled up in, uh, in cuffs up there to the jail and uh, wait to testify up there. So I would say that this is uh, something that, you know, Harvey has to worry about as well. And I bet you anything, he'll be on the state's witness list again. So we may have some of that same same procedural battling going on between prosecution and defense. Yeah, uh, Karen is saying it's funny. Wendy knows grandparents' law, right? I thought she didn't follow the case. Remember, she was told not to follow the case at all. So how would she know about it and know it's constitutional or not? So that would have been a good question for for Georgia Asker at that time. But Lori. I was asking whether there'll be new discovery released to the public prior to trial. I think they're trying to keep more of a lid on it, on certain evidentiary items, sort of like we never got to see the, the post-conviction interviews with Kitty McBanwall. There was three of them. We never got to see those. There was an effort to seal those by Rochebaum, and sure enough, the judge granted that, and so we didn't get to see those till after the trial. So I, th I think there's more evidence like that that we don't know about that they're going to try to keep from the public. But there could be some, there could be some, some release. I, I just don't think all of it is. Veronica Schneider's asking if I would reach out to George and Sir to give them behind the scenes help. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's really something that they would um, they would need from me. I think that they might look at this, or somebody from their office might look at this in terms of tactics and strategies, which I like to talk about, and and maybe feed, give them a uh, some kind of a after after action type review on what different channels are saying, but not not sure. Cessna 101 is asking if Donna did not try to flee the country, could she possibly be out on bail now? In Florida, if you're held on murder one charges, they normally are not going to grant you any kind of bail. So I think that her age could have been a sympathetic factor to releasing her. But as it turns out, from what I hear from Florida, you really can't get bonded out on a murder one case. Murder one being premeditated murder. Can't think of one is asking if I think DEA or IRS will go or ever go after Charlie and the Adelson family, given that's all come out on the wiretaps, et cetera. I don't, I don't see that happening. Uh, they should have done that years ago. A lot of that stuff was was beyond the statute of limitations for what they would go after. So I just don't see that happening. But yeah, that would have been a great thing if they would have done that because I think there was enough information there if they would have opened up the books, had a forensic audit going on tennis girl 101 is asking if the september date is within the speedy trial time requirements well if they ask for speedy trial they have to have it within 50 days so i just don't see that uh being a part of the speedy trial requirements at all
Rebecca is asking, is it possible for that the state is building a case against Wendy and Harvey and to go after them before Donna's trial? Or are you just hoping too much? I, I think you're, you and I are hoping too much. I'd be shocked if they did. I think they're going to, like I say, wait until after Donna's convicted before they arrest another Adelson. And if you think about how much time that is, so if Donna's trial is done middle of October, let's say, towards the end of October, and they, they wait some weeks or months to go after Wendy, and then Wendy's trial takes up to two years. I mean, that's a lot of time built in. Think how much older the boys will be. They'll almost be out of high school at that point. Jeannie Crime Junkie is asking, do you not think the state will come up with something in Donna's phone or on the cloud that would allow Wendy to be arrested sooner? Even if they did have that kind of evidence, I think they just have this one at a time mentality and I don't get it, but I think they just are, are going to stick with that. And even if they had some smoking gun on Wendy, I, I don't know that they would do that. They're just not that aggressive like I would be. And like they are over there down the road in in the Jacksonville district. Misdemeanors asking how much long, how long must you reside in a certain jurisdiction to be a juror? I think as soon as you sign up and get your driver's license there, I think you're eligible. I don't think there's any kind of like six month requirement. I've never heard of that. I doubt if they have that in Florida or any other states. True crime wifey is saying, isn't there something to say about the methodical way the state is playing it now, albeit later than necessary? When do you use to convict others, pulling them down one by one, getting life? Yeah, but well, like I say, even if you're going to do this approach, wait till go after one at a time. I would not wait until after there's a conviction because that's just too many years built in. And so what you need to do is charge them within a few months of each other at most six months. So you sort of can selectively make sure you go after the the one you want to that has the most evidence uh, against them first so that would be like charlie and then comes donna and then wendy and harvey so i would say that's the order that i would go in but you don't wait until there's a conviction so there's not really an advantage to that at all except you're just building an unnecessary delay that that's my take on it and i think most all prosecutors would agree with that MM is asking if she turns on Wendy, would she get a plea deal? Well, I think they're probably not going to offer any kind of plea deal she would want. And I mean, what do they do? Offer murder two for 25 years. So she's really not, they're not going to offer like something like five years. And even at five years, I mean, it's probably more like a life without parole kind of thing. So I just don't see that happening. Plus she's not going to roll over on Wendy, despite how angry she is at her. I just don't see her doing that. Amber C is saying, considering George was willing to offer Sigfredo a deal and his appeal has since failed, do you think they could call him again to testify for Donna or Wendy? He would have probably have to reach out. His attorney would have to reach out and say he's willing to cooperate. So I just they're not going to go to him and ask him that though. I, I think they're they're going to wait and see if he comes to them. And if he doesn't come to them, I think it's uh, a dead issue. Yeah, that's another really bizarre thing why he doesn't try to cooperate. He could have gotten a not the same sentence as Rivera since he was a trigger puller, but, you know, or, and maybe they wouldn't have cut a deal with him to give him 25 to life. But I, in my opinion, the people hiring for the murder are actually more evil than the person pulling the trigger because usually people pulling the trigger come from a lower socioeconomic background. They don't have a lot going for them in their life. They're on drugs a lot. And that's exactly what happened here with Sigfredo. So to me, Sigfredo probably would have never killed 
in his lifetime, perhaps. Uh, definitely not Dan Markell because he didn't even know who he was, right? So really, but for, I use the but for test, but for the Adelsons, there wouldn't have been a murder. So I look at them as being the ones that should have faced the death penalty. And even if you didn't get it against the trigger puller team, I would go after them with the death penalty. Sanyo's asking, imagine Donna Hart, Charlie, and Wendy all testifying. Yeah, I mean, that 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 could possibly happen. I mean, for sure they're going to call Wendy again, and Donna for sure is going to testify in her defense. And what if they do call Charlie? I just don't see that happening. But, yeah, it's possible. Rochelle is saying she said she couldn't move unless something happened to Dan, then something did happen to Dan. Yeah, that's true. That was like a week before he was killed. Linda Mon is asking if Wendy's disbarred. No, she hasn't been disbarred yet. And I would say that probably she'd probably have to be convicted first before the state ethics board would do something for that. Not that it's an absolute requirement, I would say, but it, each state has a, a different standard. But I think if they looked at all of her testimony, yeah, it's really... It's really something when you have an FBI agent testifying in rebuttal the things she said on direct. Jackie's asking, did you hear the tape? Charlie asked her what the bump wanted. She replied it was regarding the price of the TV. Yeah, the TV in five, meaning $5,000 is what I recall. So the TV being the, the murder of Dan Markell and the five being the $5,000 to uh, help out the other hitman, which he did not know about. He did not know there's another person involved besides... Sigfredo. He did not know, from what I gathered the evidence, he did not know about Luis Rivera. That's why he was so puzzled with who this other person is with Katie. And Katie played stupid, even though she knew that Sigfredo brought his childhood buddy, lifelong buddy with him to do the murder. Anita Daniels asked, do you think Char Harvey will testify if he doesn't? Will that look horrible in the jury's eyes? I, I don't think he's going to want to testify, and I don't think he's going to be there in the courtroom either. So I think that will speak volumes to the jurors. The jurors are going to pick up on that. And oh, by the way, Rashbaum said he talked to some jurors, and they said that didn't matter, that, that Harvey and Donna were not in the courtroom. Well, think about the ones he asked, the ones that were saying that they would have voted not guilty. So... That's, um, you know, what, what are they going to say anything? They were trying to say anything they could to help the defense. There was some kind of agenda going on there. So I just look at that as being um, uh, just, just something you just need to toss out as not being credible at all. Speaking in code asks, what do I think Dan said to Donna to get her to take the later trial date? Well, I think there was not really a whole lot of options. They probably had the May calendar filled up, and if they don't do trials in early June, because it's probably booked up as well, their earliest trial date that nobody had a conflict was September. So the defendant doesn't have that much control over the, the actual trial date. So, and if you don't, that is unless you invoke speedy trial. So speedy trial was not invoked there. So, so the defense, I assume this was a defense delay until September. So that wouldn't be charged against this, the clock for the state to get somebody to trial. Carolina is asking, is it possible that Wendy could lose her immunity at her potential trial? 
Perhaps she had perjured herself during those previous testimonies. Yeah, so if you commit perjury, your immunity goes out the door. So they could charge her anyway, and they just wouldn't be able to use her testimony. Let's just say she testified truthfully each time. They can still prosecute her for the murder of Dan Markell. They just can't use any of her testimony. And if she does lie, then you could use that testimony, and you would definitely, by charging her with perjury, be a way to get it all in there. So all her different lies that she testified to, and they kept getting worse, especially this last time. I think all that would be helpful to show that she's lying because she was involved with it and she's trying to deflect and she was part and parcel part of the family hit job that they did. Jim Parsons asking about the text from Donna to Ch Charlie about dad's birthday present and please erase after you read. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, are they really worried about Harvey looking at a text? I don't think so. I think it all has to do with they were thinking maybe they didn't want law enforcement to ever see the text. And so what they don't realize is that those kind of things are still recoverable. So that was part of the more murder planning code that uh, that was going on there. And that's what the state was presenting. And I think that's what the jury totally, totally accepted and, and believed was accurate as well. Cat Love is asking, do you think there's any testimony from when he needed in Donna's trial that would be a reason to hold off on arresting her? I think that's maybe part of their mentality is that they want to have Wendy to testify. And just like she's done these other in these other occasions. So in this particular case, so they could all go ahead and arrest her and still have her be forced to testify if they're going to do separate trials. Now, if there's a joint trial, then you cannot have the, the defendant be forced to testify. That would be definitely a constitutional violation so that wouldn't that would never happen but if you're going to go this one at a time approach she could be she could be extracted from her jail cell there in leon county to testify just like she has before so that wouldn't be a prohibition Emma Shoe Smith, that's a good question. Will Katie McBamal testify at Katie's at Donna's trial? I think that that's something that she they will ask her to, and she volunteered last time, and she was uh, she was basically doing it on her own. There was no kind of a deal struck at all, and she was just willing to say what she recalled. Although it was was sort of frustrating to see she didn't have more of a lucid memory on what what had happened. So. But in any event, she was helpful nonetheless. I thought probably one of the best things she talked about was the night of the murder and how she was told to come by later after the money drop happened and how she got this damp and moldy money the next day and all that kind of stuff. And she was really a key for rebutting the fact that she's some person that could control Charlie and extort money out of him. And so I thought that was uh, that was key because you could see Charlie's demeanor and versus hers. There's no way she'd be able to control Charlie. There, there's no way a jury would buy that. Yeah, I don't think financial crimes are going to be investigated. I think it's, you know, their their businesses have been shut down for a number of years. I just don't see, I don't see that happening. I wish it would have happened many years ago. Cubs win 2012 asked, does Dan Markell have representation in court for Donna's trial? It seems like I saw his divorce lawyer sitting with prosecutors today. I don't know if he was there today or not. But I can tell you that his lawyer is, um, is uh, let me think of his name, something with a W, uh, Webster, yeah. I think uh, Mr. Webster was probably the server for more interest than anything and just having a chat with him. He, he was the one that also said that he thought Donna would be tried maybe with Wendy as well. So I just don't see that happening. I think that's very much... A desire for a lot of folks and also I, i'm just uh, bringing to mind now something that john told me if you remember this jeremy mutz who was a former prosecutor there in tallahassee under the megs regime he left before 
Meg's retired, but he said a couple days ago from what John told me that he thought it would have been, it would be better strategy to try all the Adelsons together. And keep in mind, this is a guy that said there's only a one in five chance Donna would ever be arrested and prosecuted. So I think that's, um, that's one of the things also why I wanted to get on this case is because nobody was talking, talking what I thought was accurate answers and, and thoughts on what I thought should be done to prosecute the Adelsons and whether they had enough evidence and whatnot. So I think that you see a lot more attorneys coming around with uh, those kind of uh, similar thoughts. And, and I think having, having negative thoughts about more Adelsons not being prosecuted and being put out there by attorneys, I think is, is allowing the prosecutors to not be as aggressive. So that's why I think it's important that we, we do cover the case and we do speak truth and encourage them to do the right thing and go after the other Adelsons and just the, the suffering of the boys alone all these years it's just it's just beyond belief phyllis is asking couldn't katie be the link to indict wendy yeah there's there's a couple of comments i've seen i thought were very insightful if you look at the photo with katie in wendy at the beach where they're both smiling i think at least one or both have sunglasses on but you can tell they're they're basically touching shoulders and to only meet like one time and be that close it looks like there's something else going on there and so there could be a lot more there that we don't know about that katie's not willing to come forward with so that remains to be seen but that's a possibility if she decides to bring up more details they, they did not really go into the that part of the interaction they, that did not come out at all in the trial. So just don't know if she'll be having something that could be uh, addressing those kind of details. Sal is saying Harvey not testifying looks bad for his wife. Do you think that them hauling him as a witness and indicates intent to get him next? It could. I think it's definitely something that he's fearful of, and he does, that's why they didn't want to come up there and testify. Think about it. Harvey and Donna not only wanted to flee the country after Charlie was convicted, but they didn't want to cooperate and, and testify for the state or for the defense. They they were wanting to just get the heck out of Dodge. They had no interest in being there for, for their son. I just think that really is such a mark of guilt. As I've said before, what what you got to have as a defendant is you got to have people supporting you behind the bar if you don't have people behind the the uh defense table and chairs there's that you know that uh, little wall there you have behind council table if you don't have in the, in the spectator gallery a bunch of people full, pulling for you the jury can see that you you're a, actually someone that's likable and lovable that's a really bad sign and from what i saw there in the courtroom with charlie's trial i did not see a single person that looked like they were there for Charlie, not a single person. And I know Daniel Rashbaum said in his interview that Wendy couldn't attend the trial because she was subpoenaed as a witness. But what he didn't tell you, he didn't tell you the rest of the story. As soon as somebody's done testifying, if they're not subject to recall, they're treated as being completely finished and they can sit there and watch the rest of the trial. That's what I've seen in any other trial um, that I've been a part of across the world. Yeah, whether it's a military, federal, or state setting, you can always have somebody be excused as a witness. And once they're a witness, they're the part of the public domain and they can watch the rest of the trial. And so she didn't want to do that either. She was driving back. If you remember, she was like an hour and a half away when they set, brought her back to testify as to uh, that issue about whether she had told Jeff LaCasse whether Charlie had looked into seriously hiring a hitman the summer before in 2013. So she was she was not wanting to stick around and support her brother at all because because they're afraid they're afraid of Tallahassee they're afraid of of them being arrested. So I think that's uh, another indicator that going after them is the right thing because they're acting totally guilty. There's nothing about Adelson's behavior that looks innocent.
Kev M is asking, might they be saving the first hit attempt evidence on June 4th? A chart of calls, behaviors, alibis, driving for Wendy's trial is standalone evidence and try to contrast it against July 18th. Yeah, I mean, maybe they could. Like I say, the more, the more details you go into on a criminal case as a prosecutor, the more you're going to find, if they're guilty, the more you're going to find incriminating evidence to support your, your case. So the same thing I would say if you're a defense attorney, your client's innocent, the more you dig into the facts, the more you're going to find stuff that supports the their innocence. But a lot of attorneys, they just don't go into the details enough. The investigators don't go into the details enough. And that's how people slip through the cracks. Glamis Girl's asking, will the prosecution have evidence that Donna and Harvey drove to Charlie's on July 18th? That's the day that Dan Markell was gunned down in his garage and not just drove by on a highway. Well, I think that the text, I think the proof is that what we saw from the text from Donna, which is like, I'm here, I'm here waiting or I'm here already. That does not sound like a drive by. That sounds like somebody waiting, right? So I think any, any assertions by the defense that she was just driving by there. And I think if they look at more detail of where they live, at the time and where they're coming from. We didn't see enough detail on where they were coming from. So if they went a trip out of the way, if they're coming from like Coral Springs and driving out of the way to go to Charlie's house, that's another indicator, I think, to help show that it's really odd. Why are you going to Charlie's that late at night? It was after eight o'clock. Why are you doing that? I mean, you learned about, about the um, attempt on Dan's life and he's not going to make it. You knew that like many hours before mid afternoon and it takes you that many hours to, to hit the road and go up there to Tallahassee. So it makes, it makes no sense other than the fact that they're, they're wanting to hold off and doing a money drop until the job happened. And I think one of the reasons that Charlie didn't have any money in his house before then is I think normally he had a lot of money in his safe, but the reason he didn't want to have any money in his safe, he wanted to be completely clean of cash in his house in case the murder didn't happen and he got ripped off like he did by those two those other hitmen that took his fifty thousand dollars he prepaid for the summer of thirteen and I think that what it really amounts to is that he was worried about them not just taking the money and run but doing a stick up at his house and saying give me give me the hundred thousand dollars so I think he was probably didn't even want to risk hiding it anywhere in his house where he could legitimately honestly say, I don't have any money in my cash. I have zero cash. He could open up a safe. He could open up any, any kind of nook and cranny in his house and show him, look, I got no, no cash to give you if, if there was a stick up. So that's, that's my theory. I think that's what, uh, the way he was sort of paranoid, the way he would have handled that. Rochelle is asking, do I think Harvey will be charged? Do you think he'll get a pass because of his age? No, I think he's uh, his age should not be a pass at all. I I, I I expect him to be charged, and if he's not, that's that's going to be a uh, a real disappointment and something that I believe they're letting a murder off that could be uh, convicted if they did did the right amount of deep dive evidence gathering and presentation to his trial as well. And I think if they would have tried them all together, and brought up all the best evidence you can. I think they would have had all all four of them could have been convicted at the same trial. Feral Gamma, I've talked about this many times. If you want to go back look some other podcasts, but just to highlight, you're apparently new here. I don't recognize your name, but you're asking why haven't the Adelson crime family been tried sooner? I mean, they had politics back in them. If you remember, if you go back, the previous state attorney chief. Willie Meggs actually came out and make a public statement after the Tallahassee Police Department was demanding that other Adelsons get arrested and indicted. He, he said that basically that he's not going to do anything at the other Adelsons because uh, they would be sued civilly because there's not the evidence there to show they had any involvement. So, and then you look at the evidence that came out in Charlie's trial, it really goes to show you what kind of a politician Willie Meggs was and the fact that there was, there had to been some kind of corruption. No, no state attorney prosecutor makes any kind of a reckless pro-defense statement like that. 
when there's all this evidence that they were the ones that hired Tipman. So in other words, these Tipman just came up from Miami on their own initiative without any, any, any Adelson influence whatsoever, without any Adelson payment whatsoever. They just randomly picked a target to go up in North Miami, seven and a half hours, uh, excuse me, North Florida, seven and a half hours away, just to, just to gun somebody down and then start panhandling for money later. I mean, it just makes no sense. And so my next video, I, I think I'm going to do that. Uh, it does have to do with how ridiculous uh, some of Charlie's defense is. I, I have something that I think would be helpful to show the, the ludicrous nature of that. Okay, Cat Love, here's a good question. It's so frustrating to hearing so many lawyers saying they won't arrest Wendy. Why are they denying her obvious guilt? Well, I say it's a couple of things. You have to spend a lot of time looking over the entire case. I mean, my brother John and I, we did a quick rough and dirty recap of the evidence that um, is out here on, on this channel. And we did that like close to a year ago now. And that's gotten a lot of reviews. And that's not even, that's not even like probably the half of it. There's a lot more out there. And so I'm going to be working on updating that. A lot of it already is updated. And so I, what I'm going to do is roll that, start rolling that out, maybe the top five at a time. And uh, I think that will help show that there is evidence there. So if you look at the evidence that's there and any attorney that would say there's not, so they either haven't done their, their homework or they don't know what they're talking about. I mean, some of these people, they've never tried a criminal case. So if you're an attorney making a statement about Wendy Adelson, for example, Epstein, Epstein is not a criminal defense lawyer. He's never been a prosecutor. He's never even tried a case where you have to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, or has he defended one? So unless he's gotten that kind of a background since he uh, wrote his book, I mean, that's, that's something that's really critical. I think it's sort of like comparing a general practice doctor and have them talk about the intricacies of brain surgery and whether they could, you know, whether some kind of brain tumor is operable or not. I mean, that's, it's just all academic stuff. They would see maybe stuff they find on YouTube, but if they've never actually done it, would you ever trust their opinion on it? Of course not. So I'd say the same thing about a lot of other uh, lawyers on the case. They don't know enough about it or they don't know how circumstantial evidence cases work. And a lot of, a lot of attorneys are not trial attorneys. I, I would say that a lot of trial attorneys are, are the types that are not hesitant to go to trial, but you'd be surprised how many attorneys are di just dreadful, fearful of ever having to step foot in a courtroom. It's very much a high pressure stakes game. And a lot of them does, are not cut out for it. And they want the, the last thing I want to do is be in a courtroom. They'd much rather be doing a legal opinion in their office behind closed doors and just cracking open the legal research and writing a long dissertation opinion on it. And they don't ever want to see a courtroom and they never want to have to have to uh, defend anybody. So I would say those are, those are some of the people that are saying that, but I think the tide's turning. I know that Vinnie Politan on court TV is, is wondering why more Adelson's haven't been arrested. Same thing with Julie Grant on court TV. And I see that, uh, Dave Ehrenberg, the uh, state attorney there in Florida, the equivalent of Jack Campbell, he's also talked about how he expects there to be more arrests of Adelson's, including Wendy. So some of these, and, 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 like I say, Webster as well. I think Dave Mutz has now coming, been coming around. Before he was sort of like saying different different statements on whether he thought it was likely or not. But the more the more that you see that came out with Charlie and the more that you'll see with Donna, I think it just begs the question, where is the state attorney's office on, on not arresting Donna as well? And so I think that's um, time will bear forth the fruit that uh, what, what these calls for justice are, are going to actually uh, bring about justice for the Mark Hills with, with the further arrests of, of Wendy, as well as her father, Harvey. Mary Patterson is asking, do I think Wendy's, Charlie's, and Donna's attorneys speak with each other? Well, now Charlie has that appellate attorney. So, yeah, I think they all are all, are all talking together. I mean, definitely. Um, now, 
when he's attorney, if you think about how when he was cross-examined in Charlie's trial, it was so obvious that they had communicated beforehand what questions would be asked. There was no surprise questions. There was no, there's no times that when he had a pause because she seemed surprised by the question. It was all it was all really like rehearsed. And so that that's that's how it came across to me as a trial attorney. I can pick up on that kind of stuff really easily. And it was so easy uh, to see that they had scripted out that ahead of time. So I'm sure that's going to be the same thing on Donna's case. There's no doubt. And it's legal to do. I mean, the attorneys do that all the time. They sort of like they lock horns and help formulate strategies and tactics and help prepare questioning and stuff like that. So it does seem to be on one hand a way that could thwart justice. But, you know, if they have defense attorneys, that's what they're allowed to do. There's there's no gag order from them not being able to talk to one another. Faddix is asking, do I believe the delay in going after Adelson's was caused by political pressure somehow related to Harvey? Yeah, I mean, no doubt Harvey was well-connected, best friends to a chief justice down there in the Fort Lauderdale, Miami area. And he was even sort of like the godfather of sorts for Wendy. And he was also state legislature before that. So he had a lot of connections and strings. He's even like the Senate majority leader for Florida from what I read. So just think how powerful connections he had. And so even if he never knew who Willie Meggs was, the way politics works is you, you know, that would have easily been a, there would have been a, a go between that would have helped enforce that. So there's also something that I've not looked into, but you know, there's state contributions you can give to judges, judges in, in all 50 States are not always elected. In some states, like uh, like Iowa, for example, there's not any, no judge is ever elected. They have retention votes for the public, but never an election to initially get on the bench. And so what happens is, unless you have the connections and people put you in the right spot to be up for a nominating committee and you get selected through your connections, you'll never make it to be a trial judge or any kind of judge in Iowa, for example. In other states, like where I'm licensed in, in Texas, in Texas, all the judges there are elected. And so if they're elected, guess what? You can contribute to their campaigns. If you can con contribute to the campaigns of them, well, guess what? If you have a case before them in the court, that could it, that could tip the scales and influence them. Or even if it's not the defendant offering the money, what if it's the defense lawyer for that defendant if they're offering money to the to lawyer? And I remember one time when I was uh, in private practice in, in Dallas a number of years ago, when I had a break in my military service, and this was uh, this was in the late '90s, and there was there was a judge there that there was a murder in in the Highland Park district, which is right north of downtown Dallas. It's like the the most expensive area in all of the in all of the Dallas Fort Worth area. All the homes there are multi million dollars, many millions of dollars, and huge homes at that. And they have their own police force and whatnot. And I remember there was a case where a judge had a, a defendant was the guy was accused of murdering his wife and he let him, even though he's super wealthy, he let him get like a super light bond, like a hundred thousand dollars signature bond. It wasn't even a cash bond or something really low and ridiculous like that. And there was such an outcry that, that, uh, he got, uh, he had a, a bunch of folks competing against him in the next election and, and he got tossed out for that. So that's sort of like the, uh, the check and balance for there. If you act too, too shady and corrupt helping somebody that's uh, contributing to your campaign. And not that I, I think there was any kind of a sign that there was a uh, contribution, but I think he was just friends with the defense attorney previously before he became a judge. And so he's cutting a favor like that. And so the guy got tossed out. And so that was like the, uh, the way to correct that kind of corruption. So here, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's any kind of like campaign funding that uh, could have been given to Willie Meggs or given to the um the war chest there for for jack campbell i don't know that at all but those kind of things can happen where they can influence stuff as well hopefully that wasn't the case there but it definitely was political ties that that derailed this for so many years but i just i'm just glad that jack campbell's doing the right thing and and at least going after two of the adelsons now with more to follow
Maya Myers, if you could ask Willie Meggs one question, <laughs> I, I don't know if you could just keep it to one question, but uh, yeah, he would he would be. Uh, it's like how, how much, uh, who was it, and how much did did you get in return? And look at look at the embarrassing legacy he has now. This is like gonna follow him, and uh, he, he's. He's now going to be known for this more than the other 40 years of, of law enforcement and prosecution work that he did. Now he's going to basically, this is the thing that's going to follow and be the most pronounced thing about his legacy. And it's going way beyond. I mean, think about it. He retired in 2016 and, and his name keeps coming up and it's not because of good things. It's because of bad things. So yeah, that's, um, it's not good. M.M. Mm is -hmm. asking, do you think Wendy would fake her death to avoid an arrest? I don't think so. You see a lot of TV shows that talk about people faking their death and stuff like that. I, just, it's, I guess anything's possible with this family, but that would be, I think she'd be more likely to flee than, than anything. Snow Remover is asking, did Wendy have an alibi for the first failed attempt in June? That's, um, let me think, I, I don't recall that if some of y'all could help. I can't remember if she was ever asked for that or if that ever came up. I don't think it ever came up what she was doing around that time. I know Jeff LaCasse was out of, weekend, out of town that weekend. So don't know what her status was, where she was at and whatnot. Roxanne is saying uh, Robert was estranged from the family when the hit happened. I actually do not believe that to be the case. I believe there was some estrangement for a period of time when he was wanting to leave his first wife or significant other to go after his true love, who was of Indian descent, and the family did not t condone that, and they actually forced the breakup because that's the one he wanted to marry, and then he wound up did marrying her, going after his true love. And so I think after a period of time, things warmed up. And so he was in contact with them. So that's why I do believe he would be able to say how they acted after the murder. So, so that was, there was a, a re, somewhat of a reconciliation, although it was still like he kept his arm length distance because of, um, because of the venom there towards his wife. I think he did try to bury the hatchet with them, forgive them and try to move forward and have some kind of relationship with his family. Cause that's really hard to do. Cut yourself off entirely from your family. Even if that's, uh, if that kind of hate was uh, going on towards him and his wife. But, but I think what happened was he cut off with them from what I, from what I understand, he cut off contact with them once he saw how, how strange and weird they're acting regarding the uh, murder of Dan Markell. And then he, he got suspicious of them. And I and I did hear some audio tape of him on some podcasts, and that that confirms my memory. I saw I listened to that a couple months ago, so that's what that's what I'm recalling from that. Ali Hunter saying, with Dana Rashbaum as defense counsel, will if Donna is convicted, will it be a good defense on appeal? I think if you mean the the conviction, will it withstand any kind of appellate attempts? I think so. I mean, uh, it, the trial has yet to happen here, so. Uh, but I think the evidence that they have is sufficient. I think they did the right the right kind of rulings that Judge Everett did the previous trials as well as the previous judges for him, I think all those rulings will withstand scrutiny on appeal. And I understand that one of the things that they're going to bring out is ineffective assistance by um, Utterman, Charlie's appellate lawyer now. That's one of the things he's going to bring out. So I'm sure they're going to bring out ineffective as well for Rashbaum and the other attorney, Alex Morris. But I, I think in the end, it's going to survive scrutiny. I think the real issue the way it could get tossed out is if Donna would die before her appeals are exhausted. And so if this takes a number of years, let's just say she goes to trial and she's convicted in October, then it goes up on appeal and, and the first level appeal and they try to appeal it 
again, after that, you're talking about several more years, maybe four years, roughly off the top of my head. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the timeline is there for Florida, but usually you're talking a number of years. So, I mean, if she dies before that time, it's sort of like the Aaron Hernandez guy that I talked about in the last podcast that, um, that, that the, uh, the attorney Baez represented Jose Baez represented him him on the double murder he was charged with, but he'd previously been convicted of murdering somebody else. And um, while that appeal was pending, he wanted committing suicide. So he got convicted of, of uh, killing one guy. Then he had a trial for two, killing two other guys. And those, and he got acquitted on that. And so he was serving his original sentence for life for the first murder he was convicted of. And then he winds up committing suicide. And that first one he was on a, having that was the appeal was pending. And so basically they erased the conviction because the appeal process ceases once the defendant is um, is deceased. So I, I assume that would be the same thing there in Florida. So that would be, you know, if somebody dies in prison, does it, I guess it doesn't really matter technically whether it's a, a conviction or not. But I mean, I'm sure the victim's family will like that. But I think the main thing is that uh, they die in prison. So. So yeah, I don't I don't think Donna's ever gonna I don't see her ever getting out of prison or jail, not at all. Yeah, Carrie B saying Katie's mother died. They didn't let Katie go to the funeral. So yeah, then I don't see that happening if in event Harvey would die. So yeah, that's a good that's a good point there. KJ is saying. Can Wendy, Georgia, charge Wendy for perjury just to be able to include her false responses used against Wendy? That's what I said before. If I was a prosecutor, I would, on a case like this in Texas, I would charge her with perjury for all three trials and then bring that out along with the murder charges, um, <clears throat> excuse me, murder charge along with solicitation and conspiracy. And then I could care less if she gets convicted of the uh, underlying false um statements and perjury i'd be looking at it from the standpoint i just want to get those in to help prove the 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 fact that you're part of the murder conspiracy plot <coughs> excuse me a second Yeah, Marianne is saying Wendy's godfather was a state senator. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's what I read in his bio. I totally agree with that. So that's kind of pol political connections they had. Blair is saying, I believe Charlie admitted his guilt during the trial after being asked if TV is code. He said, it is no code. He wanted to say, I wish um, she, meaning his mom, would have used another word. Yeah, another word for what? That was that was the whole thing. That was the code. And uh, so, yeah, it was, so, it was just so crazy of a thing. I think they thought this would be really funny to use, and they were getting really cute with their murder plot. And having the geek squad go up there. And I, I think they're having so much fun, some, some kind of glee and looking forward to the violent demise of Dan Markell that they just got, they didn't even have common sense in this whole thing. And I think part of it was they thought they could get away with it because of their political connections. And look how that, that in a large part is true because it, it at least delayed their, their arrests and prosecution for so many years for Charlie and Donna, and it's still in effect for Wendy and Harvey, but I think those, uh, I think the tide's been turning. So I think it's more like a prep strategy issue than the political connections holding them at bay. Yeah, Donna having a performance of her life when she testifies, yeah, it's it's not gonna go good. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
Yeah, another word for what? Yeah, instead of the TV code. Yeah, I mean, that's just so... I don't know why Wendy didn't go and keep asking about that. I mean, she could have really nailed him right there. Once you got somebody doing a lie on something that critical, just keep going after them until you, until you get them to, to completely shut down. Becky Ireland says that, do I think Georgia is concerned about arresting Wendy because of Wendy's abilities to hire top-notch attorneys or because she lacks proof of Wendy's involvement? Well, as I've said, I think initially it was the politics of this, the connections they had that blocked any prosecution of the Adelsons. I think they were only going after the low-hanging fruit, the minorities that are involved uh, in the murder. And so I think that I think that the longer that Megs was out of the picture, I think that emboldened Jack Campbell to then do the right thing. And so I think that uh, that was maybe a, a fear of Meg's, or at least he has asserted that. But I, I do think that prosecutors that would be afraid going after millionaires that they're going to be made fools of in court, especially if it's going to be on TV. So... <clears throat> I'm trying to find my place here. Uh, let's see. Lakeside lawyers asking if one is arrested, will they try to do it when her sons aren't with her? Oh yeah, I think definitely they're not. They're not going to do a raid on her house with, with the boys there. They'll somehow tail her when she drives alone or something. They'll just probably nab her off the streets, or if they know she's home alone when the boys are at school, yeah, that's probably the best time when the boys are at school. That way, it's in case there's some kind of shootout or something. There's not going to be as many bystanders. I mean, there there could be some kind of you know suicide by cop kind of thing or something. I, you never know what these people are capable of doing. Now, Caroline's saying that Supreme Court in Massachusetts upheld the Hernandez conviction for murdering Olin Lloyd, calling an outdated principle. Okay, maybe I don't recall that being the case in the news, but it is real rare for defendants to die when their appeal is pending. I've never heard of that of any case I've been tracking other than that one. Dee Dee is asking, Carl, in one of the wire calls after the bump, Charlie asked Donna, did it involve Wendy? Donna answered, no, no, no. How does the prosecutors get around this? Well, it's very easy. She said no, actually, more than three times. She said it like at least five times, maybe six times. And the way she said it was trying to shut the door from Charlie going that direction. So it wasn't a it wasn't a exculpatory statement. Anybody that follows the whole case, if you also look at my my list, that list would be on there that I've covered. And uh, so I, I think it was very clear that she didn't want Charlie to bring up Donna because that was the absolute number one rule is we can never discuss Wendy being a part of this because she's going to be the most likely to one be targeted by law enforcement for being behind this. So we got to completely not talk about Wendy. So when, as soon as he started talking about Wendy, if she wasn't involved, she says, no, of course it wasn't. No, nothing to do with Wendy. And this left it at that. But she's like, no, 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 no. 
you know, like, don't go there. She's trying to shut them up because, because it was about her, but Charlie just wasn't picking it up. He kept on talking and talking about it. So no, that's not, that's not the case at all. Because King, think about it. They were talking and they were talking in code, so to speak, encryptically because they were suspecting this as being a law enforcement bump in a law enforcement wiretap. So that's why she absolutely had to not had to make sure Wendy's not brought up in the conversation. If you did say it is about you and me. So, I mean, that's uh, something to that effect. So that's something I think would, would be useful to help prosecute her. Baby Renee saying Rivera testified the first temp in June failed after they lost his location. They didn't know Dan's exact schedule. Thus realized they need Wendy in the loop to be successful second time. Yeah, I think that's a good thing to argue for Georgia. Definitely. MP is asking, do I think Donna stapled the cash? She delivered a wash and package, wiped of all DNA. That's probably how Charlie got in the habit of stapling his cash. Well, I think it originally probably came from Charlie. If it didn't, his his habit of, was stapling it. And it, it just makes it easier to handle when you have that many large bills and, and, and a huge amount of $100 stacked together. That makes That's what he thought was made the most sense. And it probably was stapled before he gave it to his mom, any amount that he gave to his mom beforehand. Like I say, I think he wanted to keep all the cash out of his house. And if I remember correctly, and you guys can correct me that if I'm wrong on this, but as I recall, I think June testified that he did have a lot of cash in the safe and a lot of cash around the house. And yet with, with Katie, he said he had no cash in the house. So why would there be a difference of those two? I think because Katie was planning all along to be used as the uh, go-between and find the hitman to kill Dan Markell, and so he didn't want to get um, he didn't want to get taken out of another fifty thousand dollars like the two thousand thirteen guys that that took the money and ran, and so he wanted to make sure to Katie that he that he told her she didn't have any cash in case those hitmen turned on him, and so I think. Uh, I think that's probably the way it worked. And then the uh, the staples was probably, like I say, originally from Charlie and, and and maybe it was something that Donna was told to do or whatnot, or maybe the staples still would lasted the washing. Maybe they just washed it in a bucket and uh, sort of hung it on a, on a line or something like that in the, in the bathtub area. And so don't know how exactly it was washed, but obviously it didn't dry good enough because they had it in the Ziploc bags. And my contention was the reason it got moldy is because they actually prepared the cash to be ready to distrib be distributed after that 4th of June weekend. So it had about roughly six weeks or so to collect that mold on it. And so I thought that was really a crucial piece of evidence in the timeline. And one of the, one of the great testimonies that, that, um, that Katie gave and that kind of an earmark signature MO type of testimony is the kind of stuff that really locks in key points with jurors. And I thought that really, that really helped be another data point to convict Charlie. Yeah, the reason for washing the money, I think, was they were paranoid about having their fingerprints or not so much fingerprints as maybe DNA. And so that's why they did that. And as it turns out, that's another data point to help convict them. Dreamscape is asking, is it unrealistic to think that evidence of Wendy can be gathered in Donna's discovery to fetch, eventuate the, an arrest of Wendy before Donna's trial? Not before. I think they're going to wait for her tr her jury to be uh, convicted in her before they actually move out and, and arrest and prosecute her. I just think that they're going to stick with this M.O.
Catalina's asking, can Wendy's phone be tapped? Is yes, you know, for how long? They're not going to be wiretapping the calls now. You'd have to get a you'd have to get the judge to approve that and all that. That's that's really rarely done. You don't see that very often. It's always in conspiracy cases and long-term conspiracy cases. I, I just think that's not something they're going to do. And nor would a judge have granted at this juncture. Timothy Swire saying, nobody talks about the crime scene tape on Dan Street. It didn't say tree work in progress, Wendy. I said, well, that's uh, that's in the list that uh, John and I put together. So if you go to the list, that's one of the things we talked about. And that was like, that was like the number, that was like the number, I called it 1A and 1B. Number one was, uh, 1A was Wendy going to the crime scene that close after the murder happened. That's the number one strongest indicator of her involvement. And then 1B, I say, is her, her not doing the normal course of action of anybody having no involvement in a murder there, seeing all the squad cars there, the crime scene tape. Yeah, anybody and knowing your kids were there that night before and not knowing if they got to the daycare, she testified in Charlie's trial, you'd be rushing up there and asking questions. And uh, yeah, you would be like so, so freaked out about that. And she just like hightailed it out of there. So, I mean, that right there was... Those, those, that, like Charlie said, he goes, the, the odds one in a million of that happening, or she shows up, he goes, that, uh, you know, it's, what are the odds? And he goes, if they're one in a million, what does that mean? Then that means she was in on it. And if she was in on it, then it means I was in on it. So he's really like jabbing her for being so stupid to show up there. Cause I think that was not part of the script. I think she just, as, as Wendy, uh, excuse me, as, Georgia said she just couldn't help herself. She's so curious. She thought it was another botch attempt, and she had so much fear of what she was going to have to face with uh, Dan's motions before the judge. So she was desperate to make all the all the pain in her life go away, and it worked for a while anyway. Livio's asking or saying, I really hope Wendy gets charged soon. The Markells need justice. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, uh, they've had the patience like you can't believe. They're so respectful and polite and kind people. And, uh, yeah, it's just really, it's really amazing what they've, what they've endured with such, uh, dignity and class. And there's no hatred. Think about if you compare, compare the emotions. They don't show any hatred. They don't, no no hatred. I was there outside the courtroom when they were being interviewed with John, and we saw no hatred whatsoever of them towards Charlie. They actually were thankful that he got a decent defense. I mean, they, lo they looked at them as sort of like I would say like family members that you just feel like, you know, you're 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 feeling like how how sad, how how awful. Yeah, of course they wanted justice to happen for their son. They don't want the killers to get away with it. But the same at the same rate. This is their grandson's uncle. And, you know, it's like they weren't, they weren't, um, you know, they weren't thrilled to, to see that happen. They were relieved that justice happened towards Charlie, just like they'll be relieved when Donna's convicted. And the same with Wendy and Harvey. But there's no, there's no hate there at all directed towards them. And then it's like, what have they done to be denied visitation? So you contrast, it's like, talk about a black and white contrast between the uh the evil hatred that the uh, all the Adelsons have towards the Mark Hills. And it's just like, where's that hatred coming from? It's really such irrational. And and to, to have the visitations not take place and to jerk them around with that and have the boys not even know who their Canadian family is, not just Ruth and Phil, but also Shelly and her kids that they could be hanging out with. And and it's just such a it's such a such a cruel thing that um, 
it's just like, man, that, that hatred involved. And, and I, I understand they could say, well, like, maybe we're worried about the kid boys saying something in front of them. And, and that's where they're hovering around them like that. I was like, okay, well, if you're going to hover around them, well, then just hover around them while they're there a couple days and hanging out with them, you know, and whatnot. But I, I think the boys know not to say anything about, about their murdered dad in front of the, in front of the, um, front of the Mark Hills. I'm sure they've been brainwashed to, to the utmost degree that they know never to bring up their dad in front of, in front of the, um, any of the Mark Hills that the very few times they've seen them. Joseph is asking, do they have any phone calls between Wendy and any other member of the family? I don't know if they do. I think we've seen that we don't have the, the, the actual conversations we see the times are called and the duration on the cell phones i'd be curious to see if there's also any kind of whatsapp or snapchat conversations that that could be, could be used against winnie in her upcoming trial thunder queen is asking do you find any significance when donna said charlie to charlie dad fortunately is at work on the call following the bomb. Well, I think it's just that, not that to say that tr dad wasn't in on it, meaning Harvey wasn't in on it. It's just a matter of, I, I think he was, you know, he's like, he was close to 70 at that time. And so they, I think they're trying to keep the bad news away because he really would freak out. He had bl high blood pressure at the time. And so I think that they were trying to make sure that this is not something that he's going to freak out about. And because we did hear about how he lost sleep, right? He, having to skip work because he couldn't sleep all at night and donna as we know she was taking all that pepto bismol and so yeah it was freaking these people out and if you're freaked out like that an elderly person i mean that's enough to give him a heart attack where was that in kansas city uh an elderly newspaper reporter she had her home searched and ransacked by the police and then it turns out to it was like a it was something that should have never happened because she was investigating corruption among the police department and she wound up like dying that uh like i think within a few hours of them raiding her house so yeah law, the elderly having to deal with law enforcement issues and arrests and all that kind of stuff that can that can bring about a quicker quicker demise Yeah, and no, I just have a have a dry dry mouth here. All right, talk about Donna. All right. Now I'm not getting sick. My throat's just getting a little sore. How we're at roughly an hour and 36 minutes, 35 minutes. All right. Jeannie H is saying, I think it's unthinkable that on a summer Friday morning, Wendy's puttering around on her computer and did not take a shower before going to lunch at a restaurant with her girlfriends. She was suspicious. Yeah, I think that, I, I call it gardening outfit. She looked like she was going to go dig weeds out in her yard and plant stuff. And so for her to go and meet friends that way, and as a late lunch as she did show up, I mean, you're going to be focused on, on preparing for that. And I think as somebody said, maybe she didn't want to miss a call by taking a shower because then she wouldn't be able to maybe uh, receive a call from what the whereabouts of the killers were and stuff like that. So I, I think that makes a lot of sense.
Andy School's asking if it, it would be beneficial to test the exact number of bills used, but use dollar bills, replicate the bag, envelope, study the time frame for mold development, and try to show a premeditation on Don Adelson's part. Um, I don't. I, I think trying to replicate something like that. I mean, that's that's creative type thinking I like, but I think in that particular case, trying to match things, we don't know how much water might have been in there and whatnot, the amount of dampness and, and, and so forth. So I just don't know that that would be, that could be sort of something like you, you wind up using as sort of like, does the glove fit or not? So I don't, I don't know. And um, I don't know it's necessary. I think it's just a suspicious enough indicator and it'd be too hard to replicate that it could go either way so i don't i don't think it's worthwhile to do that it's not gonna it's not like a science per se that you, you could find that to be the case but um maybe i guess i could do that tomorrow I'll just put some money in a bag and uh ziploc it and put a little water in there and see what happens for six weeks so <laughs> i'll get back to you on that or you guys could do it as well see what you come up with compare notes Also, like a lot of, is it tap water? I mean, I would assume they're living in town, so that the water might have had some, some chlorine in it and whatnot. Take out contaminants that would have, that would affect it as well. But Cubs went says that Charlie didn't know until the trial that when he did that. Well, I think he, I mean, he should have known he had the discovery pack in front of him. I don't think he realized that that was going to come out in the trial in such a damning way. I mean, he should have known about that anyway. Yeah. He knew about that anyway. Cause uh, I think that they, they brought that out from Wendy in the other trial. So he would have known about that. I just think he didn't realize how that looks and and let, think about it he said that a friend in detroit told him that hey it's like one in a million she drives there so i i just think he thought anything they did didn't look bad but when that really when folks are telling that look how bad it looks and then that's being played to such a great degree by georgia in her closing i think that's when it really like it hit him that his sister had a lot to do with uh helping him get convicted Life goes says maybe they weren't counting on Willie Miggs retiring. Yeah, that's true, and uh, that's never come up before. But yeah, I never thought about that. So that's a possibility. They thought they had that top cover for for decades, perhaps. Although he was he was you know if he retires for twenty sixteen, maybe he was getting up there in age. I I think he's still alive. So. Mon Jeezy is asking, do you, is it odd to you that Wendy says Trescott was a short to, to Monroe Street instead of Thomasville? She misspeaks, but the hitmen really did stay at, at a hotel on Monroe Street. Coincidence, Freudian slip? Yeah, that could be. I mean, you live there for years and you have that kind of slip up. I mean, it's possible to slip up in any kind of words, right? So I just think that yeah, just like she almost said hitman when she's trying to talk about the geek squad guy so yeah it could have been a slip like that but her saying that was a shortcut is an absolute ridiculous thing that should have been a really rig flag to ice him and he never picked up on it and what she quickly pivoted when he's when he he when he did question her, it was like wait trescott's a shortcut however he, however he questioned her on he was like having some disbelief and doubts about that being a shortcut and then she goes and then she right away switched and said, well, you know, because I, I sometimes take that as a way to, you know, think back and reminisce about coming to terms with my divorce and stuff like that, which was just so ridiculous. You don't you don't you don't have that kind of thoughts on somebody. You have that kind of degree of hatred we've seen her else, elsewhere project.
And I was asking, why do criminals love going back to the crime scene? Yeah, I mean, we saw that in the Kohlberger case, the guy that murdered those four college students in Idaho. It's not always the case, but I think there's a certain amount of glee that uh, some killers have. Kathy Prosser is asking, could Wendy's testimony be needed in Donna's trial play into waiting to arrest her? I mean, I think that's what they that's what they decided they need to do. But like I say, they could already go ahead and arrest her and then have her testify. Uh, just like just like the um the testimony they had from Luis Rivera. That statute doesn't say that's you know, it only applies if somebody hasn't been arrested and and, and if they're out on a bond or whatnot. So I, I would say that that's, that's irrelevant for what I've seen. Ron Nielsen is asking, are you not surprised that there's not any Google search evidence with all the criminal activity, rewashing money, code words, fake alibis? Have the Adelsons always been criminals? Yeah, I don't know if they actually did do that. And maybe that's something they're going to do now in this upcoming search warrant that they did for the iPads and the phones, start actually looking for their Google search history. So they might find something there. Yeah, I would I would think that that's like a standard thing. I think that's like standard what they do in every single one. But I think that they they were that perceptive that they don't want to do that. But so I, I think that they would have had that already by now. But you never know. I mean, criminals mess up all the time, just like these the Adelsons have. My humble opinion is asking if I think the Adelsons attacked all the major institutions of our society, and that's why the situation is so upsetting for so many of us. Well, I... I think that it's not so much institutions. I think it's the ongoing delays, the, the brazen attack that they thought they could get away with this and the way they've been able to escape justice for so many years. I think that's the real outrage because it's not just a matter of the delayed prosecution and conviction of a family of murderers, but it's actually the suffering of the boys. So I think though that's the suffering of the boys is what really makes this raw, raw, a raw wound and it grates on so many people that these pe these boys are being raised by the family that killed their dad and uh, the kind of the kind of weird life they would have being around Wendy being told they can't search the internet and social media and stuff like that and uh, you know does she really pray with them at night in the morning have a picture of their their murdered dad above their bed I, I doubt it <laughs> and uh, I don't and if they did if it did happen she did it like the night before she testified or something like that. So she never said how long she did that for, right? So I think it was just all just a staged uh, answer. But um, I, I think those are the two major things. And I, I do think that the um, the fact that the, this shows that if you have money and connections, you don't get treated the same way as if you're poor and don't have connections. So I think that's a, that's a real, that's a real sore thing with me, I think. Like a lot of folks think you can't get a fair representation for a public defender or whatnot, or if you're like a military defense attorney like I was. I've actually been both. And so I, it doesn't, money has never gotten in, in uh, a factor in how zealously I'll represent somebody or not. So I think that uh, a lot of times that that can play into how well somebody is able to represent you, though, is, is, um, it really comes down to the individual attorney. So I think you can get a good attorney or a bad attorney, no matter what type of setting they are, whether they're, um, you know, employed by the state or, or the feds or, or the military, or if they're, you know, the highest priced lawyer in town or in the state or in the country. I, I think a lot of that may not um, be so much a factor. It all depends on how good the attorney is.
on Jeezy saying, Wendy knew the hit more staying on Monroe Street. Yeah, maybe she did. Maybe why she slipped up on that. I'm not sure. Joy Matt saying, exactly what lies did Wendy tell the Adelsons about the Markells? Yeah, that's why I say she was the main instigator of this. I mean, what kind of drip, drip, drip information would you tell your mom knowing she's, you know, just the, the way she would get all spun up and just, and be enraged about terminating Dan's life and making sure that uh, she got, was able to see her sunshines with Dan being out of the picture. I mean, it's just, I think if, I think she knew what she was setting in motion and she kept fanning the flames and she lit the match and she helped give the uh, details on Dan and also try to set up a, a fall guy with Jeff LaCasse. So yeah, too much, too much, too much of her finger in the pot they're helping stir it so that's that's what a jury's going to see and that's what they're going to convict her for and like i say i'm I, there's like you can go into 150 other items that are indicators and maybe 200 i haven't i haven't uh, i'm not finished with the list but yeah you're, you're talking about oodles and oodles of in indicators She is saying, I really hope they can decrypt the WhatsApp messages. Yeah, I, I do hope so. I mean, they used some of that in the Murdo case, so not sure why we haven't seen that yet. Oh, Dr. Kinsella is saying somebody needs to create a short for Carl of his discourse late afternoon and Charlie's testimony sh shut off court sound and just told the truth of how ridiculous Charlie was. Yeah, so what, you, what uh, you're referring to there is I mentioned earlier tonight how the people left the courtroom. It was They were so insulted by Charlie's testimony. I got so fed up with and insulted. I was doing a live stream. So if you look at the day that Charlie was testifying, it was the last day. I think it was like day six of his trial day six or seven the, the last one that uh it, it was so ridiculous that um that my nephew ben turned down the sound and i, I was just ranting and and uh just just anyway I, I can't even remember what i said but yeah i was i was going off on him just it was just so ridiculous and that, that's when i said you know what it's just game over he's done and uh it didn't matter what georgia did to cross-examine him i mean and people are thinking that georgia lost the case i'm like I knew she didn't lose the case because he did such a terrible job on direct. And um, I could say other things about why Charlie did such a bad job, but I'm just thinking right now that I don't want to give Rashbaum any tips or clues on how to, how to do it better with Donna when she gets on the stand. But he, he did some things that I would say like, or like I would say are, are just things that I've learned over the years, what you do and don't in handling a criminal defendant on the witness stand. And he, he violated a number of things that I, I thought were, were definitely not something that you would read about. It's just from my experience, what you don't do. And so I would say that, uh, that he helped, he helped sink the ship for him that way. And he let Charlie be Charlie. And that, uh, that, that's the best thing you can do to let uh, a jury see how guilty he is. So. It worked out great. It worked out great for the state. And like I say, Georgia wouldn't even have to cross examine him. He, he would have gone down. So. Carol's asking, imagine, imagine never ever speaking publicly on the death of your ex-husband speaks volumes. Well, she did speak, Wendy did speak about it in a podcast and uh, made some kind of joke about it. I can't remember the details about it. That, I know there's some comments about her calling him a late ex and sort of referring it to his latex, where it sounded like latex husband. And um, in any event, it just didn't sound like really respectful at all and loving towards Dan, like she had suffered a loss, even though they're divorced, like a loss for her boys, it came across as cold. Then also remember she mentioned that at the bar mitzvah, she mentioned the boys Abba, which is a loving term for daddy in Hebrew. And so 
that's the two times I'm aware of she mentioned him. Any other time I'm not aware of that, but. Yeah, baby Renee, I just want, this is not a question, but a statement I think worth posting that she agrees with the Markells that they're a class act who, despite having been kept from their grandsons, bear no malice towards or have not taken no pleasure in seeing all the Adelson self-destruct. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, and most, probably most people would be like, you know, not having that kind of dignity in class, but yeah, the, the amount of composure they got through their suffering is just like un, 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 unbelievable. What an example of uh, class that they set. Yeah, Cat Love, that's the other point I think is very uh, a, a foot stomp, I think, in her prosecution I'd bring up is that when he didn't take a shower, but she had time to drive 45 minutes out of the way to get uh, some liquor when there's liquor stores all around the place she was late for lunch for. Her. So, yeah, that's just so ridiculous. Cubs win is saying they've never seen a body language expert testify in court. No, they can't. That's not admissible. Just like a polygraph exam is never admissible. It's just not reliable. Hey, Mana, I did mention that I think Harvey's going to do everything he can to not be in Tallahassee when his wife testifies and is facing her own trial or multiple week trial. I mean, unless, unless, unless I'd say Donna's wife convinces him, you will be there. But I think they're more worried about him being arrested when he's there. So that'll, that'll be interesting. My prediction is he won't be there, but I hope, I hope I'm wrong because I think he needs to, the jury is, as I've said before on some of my other podcasts, in a case like this, it's a double-edged swords for the Adelsons because if Adelsons aren't there supporting the Adelsons on trial, it looks really bad. And if he's there and he's in the sitting there behind the bar with his wife right in front of him with her team of lawyers, the jury's going to be looking at both of them and they're going to be reading the body language for both of them. And both of them are going to be oozing guilt in their persona. And so they'll pick up on that body language. So he's going to help convict her no matter what he does. So therefore, if he does show up to trial or if he doesn't, I, I, I could care less as a prosecutor because I think either way it speaks volumes because the the language is going to speak loud and clear of guilt. Debbie Emma is saying, "Do I think that Donna telling Charlie Wendy has no idea how lucky she is in a jail call speaks?" To Wendy Adelson's knowledge, not just knowledge, but but complicity and involvement. I mean, these folks took the fall for her. She she fed them enough hatred and and criticism of Dan Markell, and she's out there up there as a helpless baby seal of sorts. And her family isn't doing anything to help her get out of this nasty custody arrangement that she has to be trapped in this hellhole off a of civilization called Tallahassee. So much that she writes that that spewing hatred of Tallahassee is a bunch of backwards country hicks or however she described it in her book. And frequently, I mean, if you listen to what Jeff LaCasse said, I mean, every day she's bringing up issues about Dan Markell being a jerk or this or that about Dan Markell and how she's a victim of that and how bad she is having to suffer in Tallahassee. So hearing, having to hear that on a frequent basis, I think was uh, a quite telling and that um, she kept on, if she's telling Jeff LaCasse, I'd imagine how much she's telling her mom that. And uh, so they, they had to act. And, and if, if they're looking at her losing her license or having a threat of that and for sure losing her job and then being stuck in Tallahassee, drastic measures had to happen to end this dilemma, this huge, this huge problem that uh, was festering and it wasn't going to get better for it. Wendy would have only gotten worse and she'd have been basically without a legal job in Tallahassee and uh, facing that kind of humiliation. And Dan Markell came out on top every single time and she couldn't live with that. 
And so I think that's what it came down to desperation to save her face and be able to win in court because she was losing in court at every, every step and turn. And so I think that she doesn't know how lucky she is has to do with the fact that they did, they did this for her. And yet Charlie's the one that was in jail at the time. And he was the one that was convicted when this happened. And so there's something, there's another part of the uh, sentence she had besides she knows how she has no idea how lucky she is. There's some other part to that. I forget what it was, but it also was very telling. Like, you know, you don't, you don't appreciate what we did for you to help keep you out of the, keep you out of this mess that, that Charlie's in. And if she only knew at that time, she's days away from being arrested herself. She really would have had even more choice words. Carol's asking, do, do you think Wendy's lunch pals condone the murder? We didn't hear from them. No, I don't think any of her family condoned the murder. If she has any friends dating from that time, I think there's one that she had from that time. It starts with a T. I can't remember it. But she's, of all things, a, like a psychologist that deals with parental alienation and death of um fathers and how that affects boys so it's like really that's what you're an expert on and you're friends with wendy so i, I don't understand how that works but but i've heard that they're still in contact somebody wants my cats what no way Yeah, Deanna's saying you can already tell in the jail calls he's festering at Wendy's walking. Yeah, they were both, you know, I think they both realized that they're starting to realize that that they got they got played. They got played. They did so much protection of Wendy that they they messed up and they made themselves easier targets. So they were going to get prosecuted first. But like I say, Wendy's Wendy's still in the uh she's still coming down the road here. She's gonna get prosecuted after her mom. Yeah, I've already asked that about, uh, already covered that issue about Monroe Street. That's where the hitman stayed. So she she uh, had a slip there. I'm going to look for it's already nine o'clock here is my time so i'm going to add, look for one more question here any schools asking if i think georgia will use the route through trescott and compare it to other route via video in trial or perhaps take out the jury to see the distance when he truly was from an old house I've said that before, Andy, on previous podcasts where I thought it was very critical that they drive, actually take the jury out and drive on Trescott. And uh, it was just so, so telling that this was not a shortcut. And we obviously know it wasn't about reminiscing about the loss of their marriage to Dan Markell. But no, she was doing their, she was doing their um, a drive by to see the doing a crime scene inspection. And that's the only thing that makes sense. And somebody took john and me on that route when we were there for the trial and it was so so compelling there's no way anybody would believe her on that absolutely no way it was like a long windy road it was almost a mile from that corner she said she never turned on but then she did turn on there according to other testimony in trial and um it was uh there's like so many trees and bushes there's only a sidewalk on the side of the street that as you're going down towards Dan's house it was on the sidewalk is only on the right it's a narrow sidewalk and there's no sidewalk on the left there's so much there's so much trees and bushes and foliage and stuff there that you would never want to drive that route because there's also speed bumps it's there's not good visibility and you also have 
you know, you'd be wondering about kids playing in the street or and whatnot, running them over. So you'd go extra slow where if you went on one of the other streets, even if you wanted to go down to that liquor store, you'd not turn on Trescott. That's the last place you would go. It just makes zero, zero sense. And if you drive on Trescott, it's game over. It's it's like uh it's like such a such a huge point. All right, I think that's gonna be my last question. Let me see if there's something else here. Uh, JY says, it seems odd that they're only now just getting a hold of Donna's iPad, phone, laptop. Why would that not already taken these? Well, I think because to get a search warrant against the Adelsons, you needed Willie Meg's assistance in that. And so that's how he was able to thwart the Tallahassee Police Department. So they were like really button heads. And so I, I would say that um, I would say that that's uh, that's another indicator that how how long it's taken for them to climb out of this uh this protection racket that was going on for the Adelsons. And just to finalize, Donna is asking what, Donna at 505 is asking, what is the strongest evidence against Wendy? I've already said it, I believe tonight, 1A and 1B is driving down Trescott and 1B is not going to check on the kids there knowing that they were in that house at night and she didn't know if they even made it to daycare. So that's 1A and 1B. Those two things is absolutely like, like, um, Charlie was even saying that, you know, one in a million chance she goes there and then you don't even check on the boys. Sorry, it's, it's game over at that point. That's all you need to, to really show that you're a co-principal, uh, that you were a key player in this. But like say there's, there's close to 150, 200 more data points that they could present at trial to show her involvement. So Okay, what are you saying here? Murder by Maestro saying, I really want Carl to see because it was such a mystery at the time. Okay, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'll check that later. So, um, oh, here's one last one. Uh, Robin is asking, are, am I going to cover the Crystal Rogers case? I would like to. I'm, I started looking at that. And so, yeah, I, I want to cover that one. And whether I have the time or not, I will see if I can do that. But I've already expanded now to cover the Jared Bridegan case there in Jacksonville. And the thing is about this case, it's in K Kentucky. So we're not going to see as much information about that. But there's a lot more that's coming out in public. Because think about it. They don't have the sunshine laws where you can see all the f files, the uh, police reports and stuff like that. For Kentucky, to my knowledge, most states are not like Florida. So, But, uh, yeah, that's one I'd like to cover. I mean, there's a number of other cases people are asking me about, including cases out in, in uh, Utah and Colorado and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's just way too many of them. But uh, I had the most frequent requests for the uh, Brightingen case from, from what I recall. And so that's why... I also was curious to see how this Jose Baez conducted himself at trial, and uh, I've not I've not seen him in court before, so I want to see how he does to uh, justify the many millions that he's making off this. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. You got some other good questions here. Thanks for your participation and support for Justice for the Markels, and uh, also for the Brightigans as we as we're sort of comparing those two. And like I say, just if you, if you start looking the, at the Brightigan case as well as this case, compare and contrast the way the two prosecutors for each of these two cities so close to each other are taking down these two families. And in any event, I, I like the style a lot better than what's going on in Jacksonville. So come to your own thoughts and conclusions. Either way, let's support justice for, uh, for both these families and uh, appreciate your attention and your focus and, and making sure that uh, – that we have the uh, pursuit of justice still being pursued out for these families. So thanks. Have a good night. And um, I'll talk to y'all later.